Have you ever stopped and thought there may be a method to the madness? You know, along the way, sometimes we kind of get ourselves into a situation where we fall into a pattern of living and doing things in a certain way, and we, we kind of find ourselves going through the motions. Sometimes I, I know it's hard for you to believe, but sometimes I don't know if I wash my hair or not. I get done with a shower, and one of the th- last things that I do is I, I wash my hair. I, and I know you're like, well, there's not much to wash, but still the truth is sometimes I'm like, well, did I use shampoo? Did I do whatever? You know, and I just fail to remember because it's such a part of my daily life that I fail to remember if I did it or not. I, 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 I've caught myself when I've got a towel on top of my head and, and drying my scalp. I, I'll go and tell it like it is. And I'm like, did I actually use shampoo for the hair that I do have on top of my head? Did, did, did I even, do I even remember washing my hair? I, I remember being under the shower. And so once in a great while, I'll wash my head first. And it messes me all up. Don't get me wrong. When I do it, I'm like, well, now do, what do I do? Where's my rag? I got to wash my face. I got to. Why did I do that? I did it to remind myself what I need to be doing. And it reminds me later on when I go back to my normal way of re- being thoughtful and mindful of what just took place. And so over this series of messages from time to time you're going to get caught off guard you're going to do something a little different you're going to have the order of service maybe changed or a different type of song being sung because we want to break the norm so that it doesn't become so commonplace in our life that we fail or take time to remember the significance of what is taking place in our services And so over this series of messages, we ask questions. We asked, start out a couple of weeks ago, why are we even here? Why do we even get together on a weekly basis? And and we, we, we said, well, the answer to that question is we come together to worship a holy God. We were created to worship. But to understand that, we had to say, what is worship? And so we spent an entire message talking about what worship is. Last week, we began to say, well, we know we come together. We know we come to worship. But what takes place in that? Praise of God. So we said, well, what is praise? And every week, without fail, we take time to come around the Lord's table. We'll say it's the central part of our service. We say that it's the most important thing that we can do. As a matter of fact, I've had people say at times, I'm sorry, preacher, I won't be able to be here for the message, but we'll, right after communion, we'll have to be leaving. We've got a function or we've got a commitment that we need to be a part of because it's right in the center of our service, purposely put there. But sometimes we simply get to the part of the service. We hurry up and we rush through the thought of it. We take the elements and we say, okay, we've done, now let's go. And even when we sit here and we've taken in the entire service, sometimes we fail to see the significance of what God is trying to do through this holy time around his table. And so today the question has been asked, well, why do you take communion every week? I've been in churches, Dan, where... Uh, we only took communion where the church I was at before, once a month or once a quarter or once every year. But in New Testament, you take communion every week. Why do you do it? Another was, another question I asked, they said, well, why do you take it when it goes by? The familiarity in which I had was uh, we would have the elements passed out, maybe the bread, and then, then we would have the cup passed out, and we would all take it together. And even in our own churches, there's always some variances in the way it could happen. In early church, when Alexander Campbell was uh, an old likes at Cedar Scottish Presbyterian, he's a, Alexander Campbell is a founder of the, one of the founders of the restoration movement that we're a part of. And he, he, he was 
wrestling with how the elders would fence the table is the te term that used to be used. Uh, you had to receive a token when you came in the door. Could you imagine today if we, we had men standing there with a, a box or a bag of, of tokens of some sorts, and they had been examining your life all week long. They kind of had their eye on you, and they, they maybe thought something wasn't quite right. And they said, well, no token for you today. I, I'm sorry. You, you've, you've got something you need to get right with the Lord or with one of your fellow brothers or your wife or your husband or whatever the case is. We don't do that. And as we'll look at later, it's going to be between us and God. But in that early stage, it was so significant that he said, I just had a hard time with that. And something must be between God, so sacred between God and man that another man can't come between it. And that began to fuel his heart and his passion about understanding what God wanted to do with him as restoring that first century element of the church. So look at with me in the scriptures from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We often use this passage <clears throat> when we look at scriptures and we, we think about uh, what the institution of the Lord's Supper was and how Paul was instructing the church at Corinth and some of the things that have gone on there, as we'll look at later, people were getting drunk. They were using fermented wine, and we don't use it in our services, but some do. Uh, nothing wrong with it, nothing anti-biblical about it. Uh, you could use wine every week. We, we choose not to for various reasons. Number one, uh, we know people are struggling. Maybe some of you are sitting here today and you're recovering from alcoholism. And, and that little bit of temptation would be in front of you. For other people, you're just saying, I wouldn't want to cause a stumbling block for other folks. Some people are, are teetotalers. And I, and I wouldn't want to cause a problem with anybody. So, you know, as long as we use uh, the same thing that Jesus used, which was Welch's grape juice, I'm okay with it. The Babylon Bee is a satire little writing that comes out. And not long ago, they showed a picture of this Welch's grape juice bottle, uh, where it looked like it was lying in the sand, some far Middle Eastern uh, land somewhere. And it says, archaeologists have uncovered uh, the very first uh, elements used for the Lord's Supper, the very first one that was ever found. Because everybody says, if it's not Welch's, you can't have it in church. It's just not holy. It's not sacred, after all. How dare you use the sore brands of whatever the case may be? An Episcopal minister friend of mine, they have a service where before the morning services start the day, for that day, they have a consecration service where they pray over it and they sanctify the elements and, 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 and it's been holy and it must be used up that day. And so I asked him, I said, well, it's okay. I said, what do you do with it? He said, well, by the end of the day, if you don't use it up, when we have our final services, you know, the, the priest is required to drink the rest of the wine. Said, hmm. I said, no wonder your sermons get a little spirited in the afternoon. Then I, I said, but, you know, that's all well and good, but I've never seen anybody say, give me all the rest of them crackers. Let me finish them babies up. We do things differently. And that's what the Lord's Supper should be, something that draws us to say, why do we do what we do? And, and so Paul has found out that in the church at Corinth, they've been doing some things that wasn't what God wanted them to do. It wasn't what he intended them to do. And so we read here together in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. He says, for what I received from the Lord. That's a good thing to know. You want to underline those words in your Bible. I received from the Lord. What I also passed on to you. Don't try to pass on anything that didn't come from the Lord to begin with. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Not because of the preacher's preaching, but because of sin in their life. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home. So that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further instructions. The essence of the Lord's Supper, communion, is about stopping long enough to remember what Jesus did on the cross. I loved what our young people did. I, I loved that some of them were here and others were drawn straight to the cross. And they stood there and they, they, they worshipped in front of the cross. And when it was over, they were all at the foot of the cross. And, and, and our Jennifer, choir director, she says, how are we ever going to follow that? How are we ever going to follow that? But when we come together, we have to always ask ourselves, when we've taken communion, how can I ever follow this? The first thing that we need to understand when we come together weekly is that we are to remember. Those first couple of verses that we read, verse 23 and 20 through 25, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, Jesus has given his disciples something to think about. He's given them something to remember. He says, here's what's going to take place. I'm trying to remind you something is coming down the road. I've been telling you about it. It's getting ready to happen. You need to be prepared for it. But use it as something to give you hope looking forward in the future. He's about to go to the cross. Jesus is about to be broken as the bread is broken. And we look in the little plate and we see different little elements and pieces of it. And the cup is to refer to is blood that's been spilled for you and I. He, he made a covenant or an agreement with us. He said, every time you do this, I, 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 you see me, I'm still bound to my side of the covenant. And whenever you take it, you're saying, I remember my part of this covenant as well, Lord. I'm committed to you. In the South, we have traditions I mean, we have traditions in the way we do church services. We have traditions in the way that we gather uh, for family get-togethers. We have traditions in the way that we uh, worship the holy ball on Sunday, Saturday afternoon when, the, when, when football season comes up for your favorite college. They put on a certain hat, and they, they got to wear their certain shirts, and we got traditions. Well, one of my favorite traditions in the South is the history is giving... Uh, a meal for the families of someone who's just passed away. It's just a way of honoring them. It's a way of remembering the person, allowing their family to come together and spend some time reminiscing and fellowshipping. Uh, it, it's just a way that we remember as they prepare to bring comfort and strength to one another. And so one of the things that we gather from when we remember what Jesus did was not simply that he had to die and the brutal death that he died, but that he brings us hope. And there's warmth in it when we look beyond what took place there. And that's what we're to remember today. Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and yet he gives us something stronger to look forward beyond that. I've got eternity in front of me. God says, here's eternity. It's right here, and all you need to know is that it comes through the blood of my son who went to the cross. And so when you share in communion in a little while, remember. Secondly, when we take communion each week, we are to rejoice. Most of the time when I come with, get together with people and when we offer meals for people who have just lost someone, we do see some tears from time to time. It's just going to happen. It's part of the grieving process. 
But majority of the time when we get together and we hear the stories, most of the time there's one fond reminiscing. There's rejoicing about what that person has done for them or how they responded in their life. That's always a great thing, isn't it? Verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So not only do we think about his death, but we find out in that little passage, we proclaim his death. We could say that's a finality for man. That's the way we look at things. But then when we think about what Jesus has done, he says he, we proclaim it to when? Till he comes. In that one little statement, you know what that tells me? Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And because he says he's coming... That means he's coming back, and I get a chance to see him face to face. I tell people all the time, you'll never know what people are looking for in Jesus. But I can tell you one thing, you're the only face they'll ever see till they see him when he comes back in person. So make it to be a good one. Make it something that people can rejoice about when they come in contact with Jesus. I rejoice when I get to come and worship on Sunday mornings with you folks. Uh, when I praise the Lord, when I get ready to come around the table, it, there's a certain little sound that resonates with me. It is such like you know, people said, so-and-so was music to my ears. You know what's music to my ears? You know, on preachers, they got certain things to get on their nerves. I never used to think it did, but it does. People opening candy wrappers in the back of the church. It's amazing. You can pull one little mint or something out of a little package, and that thing, you could just fold that thing, and it's like, shh. And we had a lady in my previous congregation. She would get a piece of candy out. And she would open that thing up, and she would begin, get it out. She'd pop it in her mouth. It was fine. But for some reason, she needed to see just how tiny she could fold up this piece of cellophane paper. And, 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 you know, babies crying, I'm good. People coughing, that's fine. You know, somebody snoring, we overlook it. <laughs> but when it comes to that thing, it's just like, this, what is that? Who's got that piece of candy? I, mean, I think that's from being married to Amy. <laughs> there are certain things that get on Amy's nerves, you know. And that's one of them. They have something, she's like, can you put that down? I'm like, what? I'm just getting a piece of candy. Well, get it and put the paper down. You know, the Bible does say when we become married, we become, the two become one flesh. And maybe we pick up on some of those things along the way. But that's something that kind of I don't rejoice in on a weekly basis. You know, I don't let it be a hindrance to my fellowship with the believers, but some things do get on our nerves. What we have to realize, though, is when we come together, one of the things that resonates with me that I love to hear the melody of saying is those little cups going into the, back into the plate. You know why? Because I know that's just another brother or sister who has just remembered and rejoiced in what Jesus has done. So whenever you take that thing out and you put it in there, if you drop it a little hard, that's fine with me. That's a sweet sound. And I would hope it would be something that you could rejoice in as well. Because there are people around you that are come together and they are celebrating and loving the same Jesus that you love. And they're receiving the same love that you love. So anytime we come together around the Lord's table, we should be drawn together and thinking about the wonderful people that God has placed in our life. Communion is not about simply about looking back, as I mentioned before. It's about looking forward. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, not many people go down to the cemetery and say, you know, can't wait till you come back. We may have wishful thinking. We may even say, oh, if I could only speak to Mama one more time. Oh, if I could just sit down and have one more talk with Daddy to get some advice. But we just got wishful thinking. And yet the Bible says there's a day when Jesus is coming back. And we can be excited about being with him. Max Ocato in his book, Six Hours, One Friday, tells the story of a missionary in Brazil who discovered a, a tribe of Indians that were there. But they were in such a remote area that, that they were cut off from the rest of the world. There was a river that was nearby where, uh, where they lived. And 
and, and they were afraid of it. They said it was inhabited by evil spirits. And you couldn't go into water because if you did, you'd die. And they had this disease that had gotten into their uh, tribe and their camps, and it was spreading. It was contagious, but it was curable and treatable. But they had to go to the hospital or go to where the medical treatment was on the other side of the river. And so people were literally dying to keep from going through this river. As a result of that, this missionary says, look, I know we've seen this before. We can treat it. We can save you. But you have to go on the other side of the river. He said, we can. So he walked over and put his foot in the water. See, nothing evil is going to get you. You're fine. That didn't work. He reached down and sloshed it around with his hand. That, they still wouldn't do it. Finally, he dove in, and he swam to the other side, and he came out. And when he stood there, they were cheering. He pumped his fist in the air. And this victory took place. And one by one, they crossed the river. Sometimes things hold us back from being willing to celebrate and do the things that we know we can do. There's something in our life today that we say, I feel so unworthy about being around the Lord's table. I don't think I could go and be around his table because I know what I did last night. Or I know what took place. Or I know what's in my heart about this person or that person. God says, I can restore you, but you have to be willing to let it go. That's the third thing we need to be thinking about when we take communion this morning. We need to be willing to repent of sins that are in our life. Verse 27 and 28 says these words, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to eat, uh, examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Now, if Amy was sitting under and said, See, he's talking about men. Men. You guys. But he's talking about people. When he talks about a person, he's talking about, when he re refers to man, he's talking about people in general. There are things in our life sometimes that we cannot bring to the Lord's table. There's sometimes we got to go get it right before we can be right with him. You know why? Because these people that Paul was writing to in the church of Corinth, they were sinning against one another. If nothing else, they were using the elements that were laid before them to be a sacred moment with the Lord to indulge themselves and push other people away from the Lord's table. Could you imagine when the elements came by and the tray was passed down and you get there and Phyllis is right there on the front and she hadn't ate breakfast. And so when she gets there and she's like, I ain't had no breakfast. I'm just going to eat some of these crackers a little bit. And she's got this little tray of, of, of juice sitting in front of her and she, she sits in the lap. And, you know, and I could imagine of all people... Kevin Mosley trying to help her out. Kevin's like trying to take the thing from her. But he's, Kevin's very gentle. He's very caring and loving. He don't want her to do anything to offend anybody. And could you imagine Kevin saying, no, look, it, you, you okay? We can have that back. You know? And, and, and could you imagine when she starts picking it? She says, well, I got to wash down some of these crackers. You know? She's just like, <laughs> she'd just be going to town. Now, we laugh about it, but that's what's taking place at the church at Corinth. They, they're using the food, the elements, the bread, and the, the, the wine that's there, and they, they're indulging themselves. And when they do, they're sinning against their fellow brother because that is something they should be doing together in remembrance of the Lord as they come together. But at the same time, they're sinning against God. You, you understand? And I would think that's something that needs to be repented against. When we've sinned against God, we've sinned against our fellow brother. And God says there's a time of self-examination that needs to take place when, when we come around his table. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's telling the people that's what needs to be, be, be taking place. We need to look at our lives every week, and, and, and if not daily, and, and asking ourselves, do I have an appearance problem? Am I only looking and trying to put on the air of appearance? Or are there things in my life that... I need to be doing better at so that I don't make Christians look awful. You remember they were getting drunk. They were quarreling, arguing with one another there in the church at Corinth. And Paul's basically telling them, said, look at yourself. What a mess you've made of yourself. What kind of example are you setting for those around you so that they may be able to see Jesus? And then he adds some sobering fact that God has already begun to cleanse the church. 
You hear what, see what he said? God's already begun to cleanse the church by sending some of them to an early grave. And he said, some of you have fallen asleep. I made a joke about the preacher's preaching. You know, but the truth of the matter is some of these people were dying or an early death because they were dishonoring God and dishonoring God's people. They had sin in their life they hadn't repented of. And so we need to confess our sins and we need to come before the Lord uh, with, a, with, with a clean heart and, and when we get ready to go to communion. We need to ask ourselves some questions. And maybe we just need to say, have I walked with God this week? When I referenced Alexander Campbell earlier, I don't blame the elders because obviously they had seen blatant sin in people's lives. And they're saying, let me guard this. Let me guard you. But in doing so, we were saying we're pushing people from the Lord. But what we need to be asking ourselves on a regular basis, have I walked with God this week as I should be as a Christian? Am I acknowledging him as Lord of my life or am I only giving him lip service when I'm around other people? Am I, am I surrounding, uh, surrendering my life to him on a daily basis? Or what is it that I am holding back? Am I holding a part of myself back from him? And I give him the good churchy part, but I'm keeping everything else. I tell people all the time, I get the best of people on Sunday. Not many people are going to go and say, let me just tell you what I did last night. They come in, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Everything's wonderful. Kids are great. Husband's great. Wife's great. Family's great. Job's great. Everything's great. Now, they got a bunion or they been having a back, aching in the back. Well, I'll tell you what. I've been having this little pain here. But every, relationship-wise, everything's great, correct? Isn't it amazing the way that we go about our life that way? I get the best of everything from people most of the time. You know why they don't want me to know? Sometimes it's most obvious, and it does happen, but the truth of the matter is God already knows. So we need to ask, am I giving him all of myself, or am I holding part of it back? Am I walking with him? Have I done something that is in clear violation of God's word? If that's the case, I need to repent of it so that we can be reconciled with him on a weekly basis. Reconcile means to restore to friendship or harmony in communion. Isn't that amazing, the way the word plays itself out in front of us? We're, we're given the opportunity not only to repent, but to be reconciled with God. There are times in our life where we need to be reconciled to each other, but each week we need to be reconciled to God so that we can understand the blood of Christ that covers our lives, that cleanses us from the sin that are in our life. Colossians chapter 1 verse 22 says these words, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Sometimes we hold on to stuff longer than we need to hold on to. When you've repented of something, give it to God and give it away. Don't keep picking it back up and going back over it again, beating yourself over it with it, because the Bible says that you've been reconciled through the blood of Jesus. Why not let him handle it? The Bible says that he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's a long ways. I'm not very good with uh, geometry and, and geolo uh, whatever the case is, you know, going different directions and looking at all of this geography. That's what I wanted to say, not geometry. I'm good at geometry, but maybe I'm not geography but i can tell you it's a long ways from the east to the west if you keep going from one one end to the other so why do we hold on to those things we need to be reconciled with christ first corinthians chapter 11 verse 29 says for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the lord eats and drinks judgment on himself if i come in here and i'm only focused on myself have i only reconciled with god no I'm focusing on what I want, what I need to do, what I want for my life. And I haven't given myself to the Lord. So we're all part of one body. We are part of the, body, the Lord's church. And, and we need to be willing to give ourselves over to him because of what he's done on the cross. And if I have resentment toward even one person in my life, I'd be judging myself to take communion. And a lot of time we've done that, haven't we? There's something in our life that could be people say all the time well how are things going great great everything's going great and you find out that they had kicked the dog and 
they stepped on the cat and they had fought with their husband or their wife on the way. They had to beat the youngest to get them to church by the time they walk in. They said, but we're ready to worship today. We're all ready. No, we need to make sure our heart is right when we come in to give ourselves to him. James chapter 5 encourages us to confess our sins to one another and to pray for each other so that we can live life together in a way that is, uh, would bring healing to us. The prayer of a person that's living right, the Bible says, will, will, will give God something to build us up with. That God wants to reconcile us. You know, finally, when we come in, in just a few moments, we're going to ask the men to come back. We're going to be able to reflect on what God has done for us. You know, I was having a conversation just last night. Somebody had asked me, had I ever read any Stephen King novels? I said, no. Don't read them. Don't watch his movies. Don't do anything. People say, oh, I love it. I, I don't. It takes a lot of evil to come up with some of the stuff that comes out of people's minds. It's one thing to come up with a bad thought. You know, hit your finger with a hammer. You might say, have a bad thought, or might, you know, say a, an ugly word. You don't want to, but it comes out. But it's quite, quite another thing to write five or 600 pages of that stuff. It, you had, and I'm not criticizing the man. I'm just saying that kind of stuff in general, I'm not going to open my life up to. Why? Because God desires more from me than to let that kind of, evil in my life now what god tells me to do is when i come in i should reflect on how good he is and how wonderful he is and what he's done in my life as a matter of fact philippians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 says finally brothers whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things then he goes on and says whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, if I was going down that road of reflecting and thinking and letting my mind get into that evil realm where we see all that stuff all the time, I'm not dwelling on these things. I don't have good stuff to think about and reflect on when I come around the Lord's table. And for too many of us, that's what we get sucked into, into the world. You go watch TV. Now, I'm all good. I'm all, I'm good with a good who done it? Let's find out who did it. Lock them up. Let justice prevail. And that's the way a lot of programs will start out. They start out as good whodunits, but eventually they find out just how evil somebody can be. As a matter of fact, a lot of the programs that are on, like the CSIs and the Criminal Minds and things like that, they got some rough-looking folks that show up in there and rough-living folks and pure evil folks to the point where they started attacking and even coming back later on and the the law enforcement officers and the FBI agents, they become the victims of some of the same people. It's like evil is always in front of you. And why do I want to reflect and think about those kind of things on a daily basis when God has given me so many great things to think about? So when I come into the Lord's house, I don't have all that junk in my mind. I've only got the good things that God has been doing and blessing me with. I hope that you came today thinking along that way as well. Reflect on what God has done for you. Rejoice in the things that he's doing. Know that you can be reconciled through the blood of Jesus. We're going to ask our men to be coming back. And in just a moment, we're going to share in this time of communion. And I hope as you celebrate communion with you and the Lord and your fellow believers, as that element comes by, Maybe there's something that has jumped out into you that you can say, thank you, God. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you that my Lord is not a dead God. He's a risen Savior. Most importantly, Father, thank you that you received me as one of your children. We're going to pray, and then we're going to ask them to serve the elements. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, once again, we stand before you as men uh, who get to present these elements to your people. Knowing that, God, there's been an awesome responsibility to think about what we're doing. We pray for each person in this room as we get ready to come around this table. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that when we reflect on the cross, we see you. But we don't leave you there. We, we, we see the celebration 
that comes beyond that for eternity because of the blood that was shed there. It covers us when we couldn't cover ourselves. I pray for each person that takes this time now to reflect on you, that, Lord, when we come around your table, we have a renewed passion about it. We'll know we've been in your house. And one thing we can't fail to think about that we have not done is that we have been with Jesus because of these elements. In Christ's name, amen.